Now the standard teaching is you reach your peak bone mass at about 30 to 35 and typically from that point onwards it's all downhill and so you can see that on this picture here the medium bone density starts to fall at a certain point. Now there are some exceptions to that but what this implies is um, your peak bone density is going to determine in part at least how careful you need to be about bone density later in life. In other words if your peak was not that great then you may have less bone density to play with than someone who's got a higher peak. And so you might need to be a little bit more careful about your strategy around preserving bone density. Now, if you want to build bone, you need to know what's in it. So bone is made up of a bunch of different compounds. The primary component of bone matrix is something called hydroxyapatite. So that's basically calcium and phosphorus. There are other minerals in the matrix, including uh, magnesium, potassium, sodium, copper and fluoride. But one thing a lot of people don't realise is our bones are made up of about 40 to 50% protein in the form of type 1 collagen. So all these minerals are really encased around this scaffold of protein and that's going to be relevant later on. So let's say you've been diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis and we want to prevent a fracture later in life. The first thing everyone gets told to do is go and get some calcium. And while calcium does make up a major portion of our bone tissue, High dietary calcium intake doesn't seem to be that protective against osteoporosis related fractures. Further to that, calcium supplements alone were not that useful in clinical trials. In fact, if we give people high dose calcium, it can actually pose some dangers because it can potentially increase your risk of, calcium, of uh, kidney stones uh, and potentially increase your risk of coronary calcification in the arteries. Because if, we're, if you're eating a, a sort of large dose of calcium and it doesn't go into your bones, it has to go somewhere else and it can end up in the, in the blood vessel wall. The second thing everyone gets told to do is get some vitamin D and that's potentially reasonable. So vitamin D is integral to bone health as it helps us increase our absorption of calcium in the gut. It reduces the loss of calcium from the kidneys and it also helps regulate bone breakdown via the osteoclast. So it's working on both sides of the equation. And certainly in epidemiological studies, vitamin D deficiency is associated with increased risk of fracture and osteoporosis. But similarly, if we look at trials of just using vitamin D alone, they're a bit disappointing. So either the effects are small or they're non-significant. And in fact, intermittent uh, high dose of vitamin D, which was quite fashionable for a while, is actually associated with an increased risk of fracture. So similar to calcium, if we just use vitamin D alone, it's not that useful. So what if we do something really clever and combine calcium and vitamin D together? Well, then things look a little bit better. So based on meta-analysis, if we combine these two supplements, you get some increases in bone density and you get some um, modest uh, reductions in the risk of fracture. So 15% uh, re relative risk reduction of total fracture and a 30% relative risk reduction in hip fracture. So that's, that's really the end point we're after. And if we look at just postmenopausal women, which are probably the highest risk group, this modest um, effect is still preserved. So that's nice. So now let's look at some less common interventions. Vitamin K is a fat soluble vitamin important for the function of numerous proteins within the body, including clotting factors, uh, matrix GLA protein, which is important for uh, preventing uh, coronary calcification, and osteocalcium, which is an important uh, bone forming protein. Vitamin K exists in uh, several natural forms. So it exists as vitamin K1, which is the plant form, and you typically find this in green leafy vegetables. That's more relevant for clotting factors, whereas vitamin K2 is more relevant for the bone. And there's several subtypes, but the most important two are MK4, which we find in animal foods such as eggs, meat, liver, that sort of thing. And MK7, which is found in higher quantities in fermented foods. So things like dairy and natto, which is a fermented soybean product. Now it's worth noting that K2 is a relatively new kid on the block. We don't have decades and decades and decades of study on it, but for what it's worth, we've got some RDIs of 120 micrograms a day for men and 90 micrograms a day for females. And it's also worth noting that the modern Western diet's probably deficient in vitamin K2. And actually like vitamin D, it's a fat soluble vitamin. So if we're restricting our fat content dramatically, then we're gonna find it a bit harder to get this in the diet as well.